Okay, so our second exam is a week from today, right? So uh, what we cover today will be the last bit of material that you will expect to see on the test, right? So 2.6 will not be on the exam. But it will be on the following exam. Now, <clears throat> we will start 2.6 on Monday, or on Tuesday, sorry, all right? But uh, that material won't be on the exam. All right, well, how did the homework go? All right. So, uh, you know, all these rules that we've been learning, you know, you've got to get practice with these. You, you have to get used to it. Um, it's something where maybe you can watch me do it in class and you're like, yeah, that's great, but that doesn't mean that you can sit there and do it yourself. So make sure that you're practicing. That's the way to get good with it. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna do a new rule today so we have this is not everything but this is the most important stuff so this is the same list I had uh, last class but I've added the product and quotient rules to our list and then also threw tangent in there so um, let's just keep in mind that those are the things that we've already established and now I'm gonna start class here with an example that I think I ended class with last time, which was this right here. So what if we have a function that is defined to be this? Now, if we were to say this, like, like verbally, we would say sine of x squared, right? That's why you'd say that, sine of x squared, not sine times x squared. So we have to realize here that we have composition. Right, so this is composition of two functions, not a product, right? This is not a product. So we are not going to use the product rule. So what is the derivative of this? Well, I, I thought long and hard about how to do this and what, what I wanted to say today. And usually I just give students the, the rule right away, like the rule on how to take derivatives when you have composition. But instead of doing that, I'm gonna try something a little different today. I don't know how this is gonna go, all right? Just, just the first five minutes is gonna be something that I didn't plan on doing until earlier today. So I wanna show you something that maybe will help motivate why the, why the rule we have today is what it is. So I want you to take a look at this right here, okay? Can you all see, I'm gonna kill the lights just so you can see this. Okay, I have two graphs here. Just ignore this down here. Um, this right here is the graph of y equals sine of x, right? And then this is the graph right here of y equals sine of x squared. And it's obvious that these are, these are different, right? These are very different graphs. And so we should expect that if we go to a value, like let's say we go to two, and we go up and we look for the slope of the tangent line, it's gonna be different than if we went over here to two and then looked for the slope of the tangent line here, right? The, the slope of the tangent should be different. They don't correspond to one another. But to get a feeling for, for why this is happening and where the rule, where the rule comes from, I, I thought I would try and show you something a little different. So let's take a look. I want us to look at these same two functions, but I want us to think about, think about them in a different way, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw this over here first. Let's, this, this top one is gonna correspond to sine and this one's gonna be uh, sine x and sine x squared. So think about when you have y equals sine x, right? What's happening is you have an input into the function and then you have an output, don't you? The input that we have is x, the output we have is sine of x, whatever sine of that x value is, right? So if I were to draw a picture, we have sine, or sorry, x, it goes through the function and it comes out sine x, right? Pretty simple. So when, we, when we're talking about the derivative of this, we know the derivative of sine of x is cosine x, that has not changed. What the derivative represents is if I change x just a little bit, so if I just make a small change in x, 
how does that, how does that impact the change in the y value? So what I've done here is I've, I've drawn, or I have this graph, and I want you to just first recognize what this line is. This line is the graph of y equals x. Okay, it's that perfect diagonal, all right? So watch what happens if I change x a little bit. So imagine I'm taking an x value right here in red, and I am <coughs> I'm taking the x in, right? And all I'm doing is turning x back into x, right? Because that's what this function does. So let's say I take that answer, the blue answer, and I take that and plug it into the sine function. Then if I plug it into the sine function, I have, do you all see the dotted graph is a sine function? So if I plug x in, right, all that's going to happen is, well, it just stays itself, and then it comes over here, becomes the x-axis. Because it's like the, the input here, the y value, now becomes the x value here, and then that gets plugged into sine, and you get a value out. So notice, just for now, that if I change the x a little bit here, if I change it, I have a change in, in the green up here. Can you all tell that's green from where you're sitting? So if I change the x a little bit, change the x a little bit, it changes the green just a little bit, right? Now, let's compare that to this picture, which is actually the y equals sine of x squared. So what happens first is x gets plugged in, right? But what do you do to the x? First thing you do is square it, right? So it gets squared, and then that answer goes into the sine function. Does that make sense? So what I have here pictured below this is like the difference between these two. See, you plug in an x first, that's your red. But instead of taking that, an like that same answer, x, and plugging it into the sine, you have to do what to it first? You take that x, you square it, and then you plug that in to sine. And so what's happening here is if there's a, if there's a change in the x here, right, Look at how much of an impact it has over there with the green. Now, you may not realize it by me doing this, but I think if I back it up, I can animate this, and you can compare the two, the top and bottom. Um, what happened? Why is that not playing? What happened? Yeah, this is my code. I, I just ran this. I don't know why it's not. Let me just reevaluate the whole whole thing. Maybe I made some adjustments. Let me see what happens here. Yeah, I don't know why it's not showing that. Okay, there we go. I, I have no idea. I just forgot who it was for a second. Okay, so let me slow it down so we can we can try and illustrate this. What I, want you to, what I want you to pay attention to is the red, the red in both of these graphs represents my change in x. So if there's changing in x, up here, this, this is changing by the same amount because x is going in, x is coming out, right? And therefore, that's getting plugged in here. So I have some change in y. But over here, my change in x and my change in y are not the same. This one's being squared. So look how it has an impact. I mean, look at the difference between these two. This y coordinate is changing a lot more rapidly, right, than this one is. And it's the x squared that's doing that. Does that kind of make sense? All right. So when we take the derivative, what we're going to have to do, because this is, this is like a chain of functions, is we have to deal with them separately. It's like, if I want to know how much this changes, if I change that a little bit, then I have to figure out first how much this changes if that changes, right? And then I have to figure out how a change in this impacts this. So it's like two separate rates of change I have to, to um, consider. Does that make sense? As opposed to here, it's just like a change here is an, is an immediate impact on this. And so there's only one rate of change to consider here. I hope that makes sense. You know, it wasn't, it was just an idea. So maybe, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. Let's just get to the rule now.
So what is the chain rule? That's what it's called, chain rule. <clears throat> I think I mentioned at the end of class last time that the chain rule is the most important. I think it's, I mean, you can't really do, you can't really do any uh, derivatives if you don't know the ones above. But the chain is the one that's the most important because I think it's the most difficult. So you have to master the chain rule. If you don't master the chain rule, your days in calculus are numbered, all right? So I even say that here. This is the most important rule when it comes to differentiation. Mastery of this rule will drastically improve your chances of success in this class and in future calculus classes. So there's the rule. That's it right there. Okay, now let's try and make sense out of what this is saying, all right? Hold on. Hold on. What it is saying is that if you have, if you want to know what the derivative with respect to x is, that means x is the input. Remember, x was always the input? So I have x down here. So if I want the derivative with respect to x of a function that has another function plugged into it, right? So we have to understand that notation first. When you write f and then g of x in here, the picture that goes with this is that x first goes through what function? G, of x. g first, right? Comes out g of x. But then that answer goes through the function f and comes out f of g of x. So just be sure you understand that, that the f is, f is like the outer function. The last thing that happens, g is the inside function. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you have composition of two functions together, the derivative of this is, now let's look at what this is saying. It says you're going to take the derivative of the f function, which is the outer function, right? You're going to take the derivative of that function, but inside of it, you're going to plug in the g function without taking the derivative of the g function, right? right. Then multiply, this is always multiplication, then you multiply by the derivative of that inside function. So you remember I showed you that picture a second ago. I said we have two steps. We have to take care of each step. So this first part is getting us the rate of change between these two. And then you're multiplying by this part, which is the rate of change between these two. Does that kind of make sense? Now let's, let's actually do, do an example. You'll see how it works, hopefully. Let's go back to the one we started class with. All right, so I'm going to write down y is equal to sine of x squared. So we realize first this is composition, all right? So what is the outer function? I mean, this does look like f with g of x plugged in, right? Doesn't that look like that? So what's the outer function? The sine function. So I'm going to write that down. My outer function, I could call it f of x is sine x, all right? Then what's the function on the inside? That's x squared, right? I'm going to call that my g of x. So back in college algebra, if you were given these two functions and you were asked to find that, which by the way in college algebra, we write like this, fog, remember that? Okay, fog and golf. So if we had this, in college algebra, we're asked to do that, then what we would do is we take the x squared, plug it in right there for, for the x, and it would become sine of x squared, right? What we're doing is kind of going backwards. We're starting with that, and we're breaking it down. We're decomposing it into its two functions. Now, we apply the rule. So the derivative of this, if you take the composition of two functions, I'm going to put it in brackets. If I take the derivative of that, the uh, chain rule says, I first take the derivative of f, but inside of it, what do I plug in? <clears throat> g of x. And then I multiply times the derivative of g of x. OK. So let's go up here and do it then. The derivative of this should be, first of all, the derivative of the f function, which is the derivative of that function. What's the derivative of that function? cosine of x, right? But we're not going to plug x into it. What are we going to plug into it? G of x. So we're going to be plugging in x squared. Do you all see that? So this first piece should read cosine 
not of, not of x, but of x squared. So maybe I'll write it down over here in a different color. Remember that the derivative of this is cosine x, and we may as well get the derivative of g, which, what, what is the derivative of that? 2x, right, just 2x? Okay, so what we did when we're using this formula is we're taking the derivative of f, which is cosine of x, but inside of it, we're plugging in g of x, g of x is x squared. So that gets plugged into that, and that's where we get this. Understand? Yeah. Times, and now we multiply times the derivative of g, right? Just g prime of x, which is right there, which is just 2x. And what we could do now, I mean, this is fine, but put the, put the, uh, Put the 2x out in front of the cosine is usually the way you'd see it written. And this is our derivative. So if you graph this function, if you graph this on a computer, and you want to know the slope of the tangent line at different places, here's where you get the slope of the tangent line. So you would, you would plug in whatever x value into this, and that would give you the slope. Understand? So what would be the slope of the tangent line at 0 for this? If I said, hey, graph this, go to x equals 0 and tell me the slope of the tangent line, what would it be? At 0. Well, plug 0 into this, what do you get? 2 times 0, right, which means 0. And then cosine of 0 is 1, but who cares? It's 0 times that, so it's just 0, right? So when I, graph this, when I graph this function, if I were to go to x equals 0, we should have a flat tangent line, which I had the graph up here earlier. Here's, 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 the, uh, here's the graph of sine of x squared. At x equals 0, we're right there, and the slope of the tangent line is 0 there. Okay. All right, so that's it. Yes? So, two times, two, two times zero times cosine of zero. That's one, but one times zero times two, that's all zero. Oh, okay. That was thinking of one being, like, as a constant, so it's zero. You're not taking a derivative. You're just, oh, okay. plugging, you're just plugging a number in. That's all you're doing. You've already taken the derivative. All right. Shall we try another one? Yeah, of course we should. All right, how about this? y equals 3x squared plus 1 raised to the 12th power. Now, if you, if you wanted to avoid the chain rule and not have to do the chain rule, you could. If you're willing to take that and multiply it times itself 12 times, all that expanding, then you get a bunch of things separated by addition and subtraction, wouldn't you? And then you could do them one at a time. But I don't think anyone wants to do that, right? Right? Is somebody tempted? Still tempted? Right? You could just make that number as big as you wanted, and I could eventually convince you that it's not efficient to do it that way. Okay, so what we have to realize is that we have composition here. We have a function inside of another function. So whenever you're doing chain rule, I always like to work from the outside in. And the way you can tell what's on the outside is by just thinking about what would happen if you plug an x in. Like right now, if you plug an x in, you're going to do all this first, right? After you do all that, then you go to the 12th power. So the 12th power is the last thing that happens, and that's always going to be the outer function. So for us, f of x here would be would be just x to the 12th. It's something to the 12th power, right? So the outer function is just something to the 12th power. Now the inner function, g of x, is what? 3x squared plus 1. So we all agree that if we take this, plug it in for x there, we get back that, right? So now we're going to need the derivatives of each of these. So let's go ahead and take the derivative 
What's f prime of x? 12x to the 11th. That's just power rule from over there. And then what's the derivative of g? So we have two things separated by addition, so we can do them individually. So 6x and then derivative of 1 is 0. Right? So according to the formula, the derivative of a composition of two functions is f prime, but inside of it goes g, and then multiply that times g prime of x. Do you, do you all agree that the g prime of x is the easiest part of this because you just need that derivative right there? The tricky part is that you have to take the derivative of the outer function, but then plug in to it the inner function. So we have to take this right here, right, and plug what into it? This, right, g, not g prime. So I want to take the derivative of f, which is this function, and take g and plug it in right there, which really means take g and plug it in right there, right? And g is this. So what is it going to be then? 12 and then parentheses. What to the 11th? 3x squared plus 1. And then I multiply that whole thing times 6x. And then I can still do a little bit of cleaning up here. I can move the 6x out front. 6 times 12. What is that? 60, 72? Is that right? Doesn't seem right to me today. Sixty pl sixty plus twelve, right? Seventy-two. Okay, so this is it. That's the derivative of that function. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's do another one. y is equal to the square root of sine x. Do you all see composition here? Inner function, outer function, yes? So if we see inner function, outer function, we need to identify the inner and the outer. So what is, what is the outer function? I always like to start with the outer function. It's the square root of something, right? It's the square root of x. And then what's the inner function? Sine x. Okay. So if you take sine, plug it in right there, you get back that. And now we take the derivative of each of these. So the derivative of f is 1 over 2 root x, that I told you to memorize. And then the derivative of g is cosine x. And I'm not going to write the whole thing down here, but I'll just write, remember, this is what the derivative is. Maybe I'll leave it up on the board now. So we are going to first take the derivative of f, but plug into it g. So I'm going to take this and plug in, what am I going to replace that x with? Sine x, which is g, right? g of x goes in there. So my derivative is 1 over 2 root what? Sine x. And then times, times g prime, which is cosine x. You could bring it up. You could, there's a couple of things you could do algebraically to this. I'm just going to leave it like this. I mean, that's perfectly fine. I just slid the cosine up on top of the fraction. Okay? It's kind of making sense? All right. Hmm. How about the most difficult one that you can conjure? The most difficult one what? That you can conjure? Oh. Most difficult? I mean, yeah. Difficult within within the realm of, of being able to do it? Or difficult that I know we can't get it? 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's slowly let's it let's slowly crank it up. That's what I'm doing right here. I've I've cranked this one up a little bit. Turning the screws. Turning the screws. Yep. Yeah. So uh, what do you see here? Do you see composition? Do you see a function in a function? In a function. Do you see three of them? So do you see that x squared plus 1, that right there, you can look at as one function, that gets plugged into sine, and then it all gets cubed. So you have to remember this, when you write it this way, this is actually That's what that means. When you have a cubed right here, it means the cubed is on the outside and it cubes the whole sign of everything, all right? So we have three, don't we? We have three. Now, I haven't shown you a rule for three, but it follows logically the same way that the previous one did. Let's see if we can't come up with the formula ourselves. It's going to be 3, f, g, and h, but what does the derivative look like? We'll, we'll, we'll see. Let's write the three functions down first, starting with the outer function. So what's the outside function? X cubed. OK, something's being cubed on the very far outside, right? It's the last thing to happen. What's the middle function doing? Sine x. And then what's the inside, the, the furthest inside function? x squared plus 1. You all see that? Now, let's take the derivative of each one, even though I'm not sure what to do with them. Okay, the derivative of this one is 3x squared. The derivative of this one is cosine x. And then the derivative of this one, I called it h, so h prime of x is 2x. All right? Yeah, okay, so that's great. We, we identified the three composite functions and we took each of their derivatives, but the question still remains, what does the derivative look like? So here's what it is. I'm gonna write it down, then let's talk about it. I'm gonna take the derivative of the outer function, f, but inside of it, what do you think I'm gonna plug in? So if it were just these two, right, what would you plug into that? Just g of x, right? But g gets this plugged into it also, right? So inside here is g of h of x. OK, does that kind of make sense? And then times, what do you think comes next? The derivative of g this time. But what do you think goes inside the derivative of g? Just h, yes? Nope. Like two or like that. Nope. Nope. You have to do them all in a chain, which is why they call this chain rule. Okay. Times again times. And now the derivative of h. Okay. So let's see if we can make sense out of that. What we did was we took the derivative of f, right? We took derivative of this, but inside of that, what am I going to plug in? I'm going to plug in this plugged into that and all of that plugged in here. It sounds worse than it is, okay? And then this one, I'm going to take derivative of g, which is this, and inside of that I'm going to plug in what? Just that, right? And then times, and then I come and I take derivative of this, and that's my last piece, okay? So let's see if we can put this together. What is the derivative of this? So first, derivative of f, which is 3x squared, right? Mm -hmm. But it's actually, for us, going to be 3 times something squared. What is that? What goes in there? Sine of, sine of x squared plus 1. It's both the g and the h put together. So sine of x squared plus 1, OK? So that's, this is f prime with g of h plugged in times now g prime, which is cosine of x, right? But not x for us, it's cosine of x squared plus 1. And then times h prime of x, which is just 2x. And I could clean this up a little bit. I could do 6x out front. And then um, sine 
Uh, can I write this way? Sine squared of x squared plus 1. Is this <coughs> the same as this right here? Yeah, should be, right? Because you're squaring the whole thing, right? And that's what this squared right here means. It takes all, all of this and squares it. And then times cosine of x squared plus 1, like that. That's your derivative. So three of them was a little more involved, right? Would you agree? Is there anything stopping us from having four? No, there's nothing stopping us from having four. Okay, let's just by a show of hands, how many of you feel like you're following this okay? Anyone feel a little, little wobbly right now? You do feel a little wobbly, yeah? It's okay to feel wobbly, Frank. Um, because there's another way to show this, another way to do it, but I'm afraid if I do another way, then I'm going to start confusing everyone. So if enough people are on board with this, which it looks like you are, then I think I'm going to hold off on the other method. Um, let, me, let me at least show you a little bit of it, just a tiny bit, and I'm not going to go, I'm not going to do a bunch of examples with it, because again, I don't want to confuse you. I want to go back to the first problem we did. All right, that was the very first problem. I would like for us to do the same thing we were doing here with f and g, all right? But instead of using f and g, I'm going to just use some letters. So what's the outer function here, the outer one? Sine, sine. sine of x, right? So watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to write, I'm just going to pick a letter here. U is equal to sine, now you said of x, right? I'm going to say it's sine of something. I'm going to call it v, all right? Now, what is v? x squared. squared. Y'all see there's a slight difference in this. I'm saying u is sine of something. So the outer function is sine of something. And then the something that's inside the sine is actually x squared. Do you all see this? Now, when you do it this way, you can make a table out of it. And then what you do is you take the derivative of these. So just watch me do it first. I'm going to take derivative of this with respect to v, because v is in here. So my left side becomes du dv, and then my right side becomes cosine of v. So if I take derivative of this with respect to v, I get du dv. If I take derivative of that with respect to v, I just get cosine v. This is what you would expect, right? Now, do the same thing here. This time I'm going to differentiate with respect to what variable? x, because x is over here. So this will be dv dx equals what's derivative of x squared? 2x, right? You all follow that? Now, the answer to that question, the derivative of that, all you have to do is take these two pieces and multiply them together. So what would I get if I write cosine of v times 2x? Well, what's v? v is x squared, right? So this is really cosine of x squared times 2x. And that's the same answer we got earlier. This is another approach. Okay, again, if you're happy with the other ones, great. Stick with them. I'm not going to go in detail. If you want to see that in more detail, you can come to my office. Um, okay, now, in reality, okay, if you go right now and you find a Cal 2 student, Right? Someone who's passed Cal 1. If you ask them to take the derivative of something like this, they are not going to write down f of x, g of x, and write the formula down, make a little thing over there like we've been doing. That's not what they're going to do. They're going to do it all pretty much in their head. All right? So we need to start to lean that way. And sometimes when I show students this way, this is the last way I'm going to show you, is this is the way that they just, they just do it this way from here on out. All right? So this all depends on you. I've shown you a way of doing f of x, g of x, and how to make a little, like, you know, take their derivatives and put them together. But see if this, see if this way makes the most sense. I don't know if I'm being clear. Let me just make sure I'm clear. The way I'm about to show you right now is where you want to be at some point in this class, all right? What I'm about to show you right now. So here we go. We're going to do this one. I'm going to bring you down a little bit, though, so I can work with it here. So here's the original problem, right? I would like the derivative of this. OK, 
Okay, so the way, that, the way that I do this, I mean, this is literally the way I do this, all right? I look at this, I have to realize its composition, all right? And then what I do is I identify the outer function, which in this case is sine. And then I just kind of imagine that somebody is asking me to find the derivative of sine of this. I don't even know what the hell this is. Oh, it's like a little wrist pad for using the mouse. Okay, so what is the derivative of sine of a wrist pad? Cosine, cosine of a wrist pad, right? So cosine, cosine of the wrist pad. Understand? Times, now, we've done sine, haven't we? Okay, so I'm not going to look at sine anymore. I'm going to go in. I go in, and now it's just x squared, and I can take derivative of x squared. It's just what? 2x. And I'm done. Okay, so that's the same result we just got, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, let's do the next example that we had done together. I believe it was, was it square root, or was that the next one? Square root? Square root of sine x? No, that wasn't the second one I did? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was 3x squared plus 1, yeah. all to the 12th power. Okay, so what's fun about doing it this way is that you can, you can pretty much use anything you want. So this time, I'm going to take this little nasty, dirty rag that needs to be washed, okay? And I realize I have an inner function, outer function, right? And I say to myself, okay, the outer function is to the 12th power. So what is the derivative of a nasty old rag to the 12th power? 12 times the nasty old rag to the 11th power. Does that make sense? But what's the rag? It's that, right? So that goes in here. Follow me? Now, you've done the first part of the chain. That means you've already taken care of the 12th power. Now you go inside and take derivative of what's in here, which is times 6x. And then you put those together, you get the same answer we just had, right? So that, you're right. I've, I've done this, I've taught this class many times. And I've tried to do it this way from the beginning, and I get like half the students get it, and the other half just don't get it. So I do that first way because that gives people who are a little more systematic like a way of doing it. But ultimately, like, ultimately, like I said, this is kind of where you want to be with it. But it takes time to get to it. All right, the next one I did was y was root sine x, right? That was it? All right, so let's do this one again. I'll, uh, let's get something else. This is just, you know, you can just have fun. Oh, here's a stapler. Okay. All right, so we want the derivative. What's the outer function? Square root, square root function. All right. So what's the derivative of the square root of a, of a swing line stapler? One, 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 one over two times the, der uh, the derivative, the square root of the stapler, which is that, right? <laughs> Now times, we've taken care of the root, haven't we? That's gone. Now the derivative of sine x, which is cosine x. And that's the same answer we got earlier. Okay, we just slide the cosine up on top. Okay? Now what happens when you have three pieces in a chain? Well, that's the one we did a second ago. It was, uh, was it sine cubed? Was it sine cubed? Sine cubed? x squared plus 1. OK. So if I want the derivative of this, now this one, remember, what's the outer function? x cubed, right? So I'm looking for something big enough. Well, I can use the dirty rag again. OK, here we go. So we have something being raised to the third power, right? So all of that is being raised to the third power. So you take the derivative of, of this dirty thing to the third power and you get three times all of that stuff to the second power, right? But what was all that stuff that, that I uncovered here? It was just the sine of x squared plus one, right? Without the cubed, because the cubed is part of the derivative. Understand? Times, now we've taken care of the three. What's the next function on our way into the sine x, right? So what we want to do is uh, do, here I have my little mouse here. So what we have left is sine of x squared plus one. So I want to take derivative of sine of my mouse, which is cosine of my mouse. Cosine of x squared plus one, right? So now I've taken care of cosine. 
and I've got myself all the way to the inside, times derivative of x squared plus 1, 2x. And that's the same thing we had earlier, just slide that 2x out front. Yes? OK, let's do something else. I mean, this is it. This is the chain rule. There's, I mean, there's nothing more. This, all this section is about. There's no more formulas to show you. Now it's all about doing examples. All right. <clears throat> so how about this? Well, hmm. is this different? Why is this different? It's not completely just composition, is it? It's actually a product, right? Do y'all see that? We have a product here, right there. And so if you have a product between two things, you, you can't throw this away. It's not like these rules disappear. These are still on, in play. We have a product between two functions. And because of that, we have to use the product rule. So the derivative of this from last class will be the derivative of this times this plus the derivative of this times that. And that's that rule right here. So this will be the derivative of x times sine squared x plus the derivative of sine squared x times x. Does everyone see that that's just the product rule? No questions? All right, now the things that I left the little prime marks on, we have to go find their derivatives now. So what's the derivative of x? It's one, good for us, right? That's one. So this is just gonna be one times sine squared x. I, I'm not messing with the sine squared because the product rule tells me not to, right? Leave it alone. Plus, but now I need to take derivative of sine squared x. And that's composition, right? So I'm going to do that over here. I'm trying to imagine that somebody gave me this as its own little problem. Okay, So like this is in its own little world now. And I'm going to go to find its derivative. So I can use these sticks here. I have stick squared. right? So I take the derivative of this. And it's going to be two of these sticks. right? Two of the sticks to the first power. And the stick is sine x. Am I done? Am I done? No, all I've done is the squared. So now I need to go to the sine, say multiply cosine x, derivative sine x, cosine x. So at the end of the, the day, this right here becomes 2 sine x, cosine x. And some of you might recognize that from pre as being a double angle um, identity, but I'm not going to mess with that. I'm just going to, that's my derivative. I'm plugging that back in over there, all right? So that just becomes this piece right here, right? That's this piece. So that is 2 sine x, cosine x. And then what do I still have here? Don't forget the product rule, times x, right? And I told you, be careful with these x's when they're next to each other, because you might accidentally push that one in there. So let's just push that one out to the front. So we have sine squared x plus 2x sine x cosine x. That is the derivative of x sine squared x, yes. Well, that's sine, oh, yes. Oh, sorry, that's a one. I'm sorry, oh. yes, this is a one. Um, I was using the power rule. Two comes out, subtract, I have a, to the first power. Yeah, if you have, if, if my, if that ever happens again, just let me know, because I want to clarify that. Okay, so here we had product rule that we had to incorporate in with the chain rule, right? Nope. That is exactly what I was going to do right now. Yeah. So let's take a look at this one. So how about this? Tangent of x squared cosine x. All right. 
Yeah, what do you see here? Just, just I want to know what you see. Composition. You see composition? Everyone see composition? What would the outer function be? Tan x, is, tan x is the last thing that happens, right? So inside of that, you have another function, right? x squared cosine x. Is x squared cosine x composition? No, no it is not. It is a product, right? OK. But we have composition is the overlying thing here. In the previous problem, the product rule was the kind of overlying rule we had to use first, right? When we did the product rule, one of our, one of our derivatives had, had a uh, chain rule in it, didn't it? This problem, we have composition is kind of the overriding thing, and within the composition, we have a product. Yes? Can I ask a question, but when you say composition, you mean like two A function inside of another function, as opposed to a function times another function. OK, so let's see if we can't do this with uh, this sheet of paper. If you look at this, you want to take its derivative. On the outside, we have tangent of this piece of paper, right? What is the derivative of tangent of a piece of paper? Well, according to this, the derivative of tangent of x is secant squared x, right? So this should be secant squared of whatever is underneath this paper, right? Which is x squared cosine x. Okay, chain rule says now times what? We've done tangent, right? So now we go on the inside and we take derivative of what's inside. But that is a product rule, right? Understand how this is working? So I'm trying to fill this in right here, but to fill this in, I need the derivative of that. And to get the derivative of that, I better come over here and do some scratch work. I'm trying to take the derivative of that product. Okay, whatever the answer is here, gets slapped in right here. So let's do this product rule. And I have the sticks here today. Marissa, did I use the sticks last time? Yeah, I keep on mixing them back up. Marissa, did I call on you last time? I did, right? I think I remember that. Let's see, how about Alberto? Called on you last time also. You don't mind? Okay, so for this, Product, since, since you're okay, you tell me what it is. Tell me whatever you want to tell me. So it's the derivative of the first. Okay, derivative of the first one times the, times the second. Plus the derivative of the second. Derivative of the second one times the first. There you go. That's your product rule. You can keep going? Yeah. Okay. What's this? 2x. 2x times cosine, times cosine x. Minus sine x. Minus sine x times x squared. So it was plus, but the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine x, so that plus is going to become a minus. We still have x squared back here. Now, I don't like that x squared here, so I'm going to slide it here. But that's the last step there, really. That gets plugged in here now, right? So I should put 2x cosine x minus uh, the x squared is coming in front, x squared sine x. Um, Nas, does that look right? No, I'm asking if I box this up as my answer, is my professor going to take off points? I mean, yeah. Why? No, I wouldn't take any points. You wouldn't? No. Okay. <laughs> I would. <laughs> why? Why? Yeah, why? They have x in common. No. What is this telling you? Okay, the chain rule says you're supposed to take derivative of something, blah blah blah, do this, and then times the derivative of the other piece, right? Which it looks like I've written, but that's not what this is saying to do. Isn't this saying to do this times just that piece? Yeah, but that, with, written that way, that's not what this means. This means this times just that. I'm missing something. Parentheses. This has to be in parentheses. It's not a choice. It's not like, oh, I can if I want. I leave them out if I want. No. It's 
this, right, times whatever the derivative of this is. So if the derivative of that turns out to be two terms, you have to add in parentheses. It's kind of like if I ask you to, if I ask you to um, multiply four times, and then over here I say uh, two plus three. I want to multiply it four times two plus three. Then I, if I write two plus three like this, you're just going to do four times two, eight, and then add three. It's not what I want. I want four times two plus three. I want four times five. Does that make sense? So the parentheses are not optional here if we have more than one term. If we have one term, if this derivative turns out to be just one term, you don't need parentheses because then it's automatically multiplied. That make sense? Okay. Let's do another one. How about this one? Um, y equals the square root of x squared plus 1. I like x squared plus 1, don't I? Um, over x minus 4. I want the derivative. Sophia, did I call on you last time? No? OK, Sophia. Sophia, my question to you is just a general kind of like, in words, kind of tell me what you're seeing here. The square root is like an outside function. So that would mean we have composition, right? Because we have like an outer function. Now then what would the inner function be, Sophia? The quotient, the quotient right? Like this is, your outer function is a square root, right? Your inner function is all this crap together, but that's a quotient. And we can handle a quotient, can't we? With the quotient rule. So when we attack this, we're going to start with the outer function and then start working our way in, covering and you know, using my little rag or whatever. But once we get to the inside, that's going to require scratch work on the side. Understand? All right. Good, Sophia. Let's go. Michael. Where's Michael? Did I call him you last time? No? Michael. Oh, we'll use the water bottle. Michael, what's the derivative of the square root of a water bottle? 1 over 2 times the square root of what? Water. I want you to say water bottle. <laughs> Thank you. OK, and the water bottle is that, right? So I'll, I'll just put that in there. OK, so there's, there's the first step in the chain rule, right? That's the first link. We have now exhausted the, the root. We don't have to consider anymore. So our next step, Lewis? I didn't call on you last time. Luis. Luis. Ah, damn it. I keep doing that, man. Let me put a little prime mark up here. I might. might. Luis. All right. Luis, I'm trying to take the derivative now. I've moved inside. So Luis, when you see this, you should be thinking what? Quotient rule. And that, unless you can do it in your head, which I don't think anyone here is doing that quotient rule in their head yet. No? I don't think anyone here is doing that in their head yet. So um, since we're not, let me write it down. There we go. Luis, we're going to stick with you. We want the derivative of that, right? And that answer, whatever it is, no matter how ugly it looks, it's going right here. OK. So Luis, quotient rule tells me I must do what here? Derivative of the top one? Uh, times the bottom one. Subtract. Subtract. Derivative of the bottom, derivative of the bottom one. Times, the times this top one up there. All over, All over the, bottom the bottom square. Is he right, everyone? Yes, yes he's right. Good. Rasul, did I, I called you last time. I keep doing that to Rasul. I'm sorry. Emily, I didn't call on you last time. Are you, are you caught up? Do you have this written down? You good? You ready? What's this? 2x, then x minus 4 in parentheses still, right? Keep going, Emily. 
minus, we're taking derivative of this one, right? So Emily, what's derivative of x? One, and then derivative of four, zero, right? So that's just one, so minus one times, we still have this, right? x squared plus one, and then all over the bottom squared. We good? Now this minus one right here is important, isn't it? Because this is in parentheses, so that minus one has to get passed through. And then this 2x has to get passed through. So I'm going to try and get through all the sticks today. Savannah, did I call on you last time? No? OK, Savannah, can you give me the, the numerator? Like, go ahead and clean it all up and put all like terms together. x squared minus 8x what? Minus 1 over our common, right? OK. And I told you all in class last time, don't, don't expand this. Don't bother expanding that bottom one out. Just leave it. We all agree? No? Why are you squinting your eyes? Uh, no, I asked her to put it all together. So she already combined all, your, all her like terms together. So let's see. They're doubting you. So here to here, here to here is what? 2x squared minus 8x. And then here to here, here to here, is minus x squared minus 1. Good. So once you put all that together, you get this all over that, right? And this is just the derivative of what's inside there, right? Which we need to now slap back over here. x squared minus 8x minus 1 all over x minus 4, that quantity squared. All right, you all okay with that? Any questions? The calculus is done. Like we have finished doing the calculus of this problem. The rest of this is algebra, all right? Do I have any questions on the quotient rule? Any questions on how I came up with this? Yes? Wait, do we have to make sure to put a parentheses on this? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So do I need a parentheses on this? It all depends on, on what's here. In this case, we have this long division bar, don't we? And that long division bar implies that if you multiply this to here, that you're not just, it's not just touching the x squared. It's touching the whole top. Now, if you put it in parentheses, that's, that's fine, but you don't need it here. Now, just for the sake of demonstration, if we didn't have a denominator here, like that, and that was this part, we would have to have that in parentheses. That make sense? OK. All right. So this is, this, is, uh, this is the derivative, right? This is the raw derivative. That's what I called it last time. This is not what you would see as an answer in the back of a book. So let's see how you would get to the answer in the back of the book. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write some stuff down here, and then you tell me what I did. OK, so what did I do here? I looked at this right here. You see that? And since I have a, a root over a fraction, I can do the root on the top and bottom like that. You're allowed to do that. It's a property of radicals, that if you have a radical on a fraction, you can do the radical on top and bottom separately. And then if I have 1 over a fraction, I can flip the bottom up, can't I? No, 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 because I'm not doing anything to the power. I'm doing a fraction like if I do 1 over 3 fourths, this is the same as 4 thirds. It doesn't become negative 4 thirds. I think what you're thinking is if I have 1 over 3, I can write that as 3 to the negative 1. That would be bringing the 3 up and changing its exponent. Or maybe I should do this. And on, the, on the bottom, for example, you're just multiplying by the reciprocal. The 1 over, I don't know, yeah. on your example of 1 over 3 fourths. Yeah, I'm basically multiplying by the reciprocal. Yep. Okay, so that's how I got to here. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, the next step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to realize that I have x minus 4 squared here, x minus 4 to the um, square, or square root of that, and that means raising it to what power? 1 half, right? Isn't that the same thing? And then you can use proper.